So we're going to continue with the urinary system. Now picking up at the collection duct. The collecting duct is a place for concentration. So this is where your final concentration of the filtrate begins. The filtrate is going to become urine at this point. And it will continue on down through the collecting duct. So how much and what is reabsorbed is going to depend on the osmotic gradient in the medulla as well as ADH antidiuretic hormone. So the presence of ADH is going to render the walls of the distal convoluted tubule and the collecting ducts permeable or impermeable. That's how that hormone is going to affect it. So if you have high levels of ADH, you have high permeability and increased reabsorption of water. So it will mean a low volume of concentrated urine. It's an antidiuretic. It's to con contain the water or help retain it. Low ADH means low permeability. It will decrease the reabsorption of water. So you're going to have more dilute urine, a higher volume of urine. So to, this is just kind of your key summary here of what goes on with ADH. So if your body hydration is high, you'll have low ADH levels, high urine volume. If the body hydration is low, you're going to have high ADH and low urine volumes. So this picture here shows the different cells involved along the way and how they are involved with the reabsorption and secretion processes. So with tubular secretion, this is going to involve the passage of substances from the blood and the peritubular capillaries to the filtrate. So sometimes what has gotten through into the peritubular capillaries blood, you want to be able to remove this. So this is going to help eliminate waste products that didn't get filtered through the glomerulus. Just because they didn't get filtered through the glomerulus doesn't mean you're stuck with them. It's also important in helping to regulate the acid base balance in the body because of the secretion of the hydrogen ions. So there's a lot of foreign substances like medications that don't actually get filtered by the glomerulus because they're bound to plasma proteins. This gives an opportunity to be able to deal with some of them. So when these substances enter the peritubular capillaries, they can develop a strong affinity for the tubular cells and disassociate from their carrier proteins. That allows them to be removed. So the major site of removal for these substances is the proximal convoluted tubule. With paracellular reabsorption, it's a passive process between the adjacent tubule cells. There's tight junctions there that don't completely seal off the interstitial fluid from the tubular fluid. And then with transcellular reabsorption, it moves through an individual cell. So it can move between the cells or actually through the cells themselves. So your glomerular filtration rate is important. 99% of the filtrate is reabsorbed by the nephrons through tubular reabsorption and return to the plasma. The GFR is the amount of filtrate that's formed in all the renal corpuscles of both kidneys every minute. So we report this in milliliters per minute. It's one way of measuring kidney function. So this is calculated by determining the number of milliliters of plasma which the substance has cleared and completely removed during one minute. So one example of a substance that might be measured is creatinine. So in order to do this, you need to know the urine volume per milliliter per minute, and then the urine creatinine concentration in milligrams per deciliter, and the plasma creatinine concentration. So you need to know how much is in the urine, how much is in the plasma, and how much volume of urine you have in a minute. So in order to maintain homeostasis in the body, it's important that you have a relatively constant glomerular filtration rate. It's hard to keep the body stable when the things that get filtered through are not stable. So if your GFR is too high, substances are going to pass too quickly and they don't get reabsorbed. If the GFR is too low, nearly everything is reabsorbed and you end up with some waste products not being excreted. Neither are a good situation. You want the proper level. So net 
the changes in the net filtration will affect the GFR. So filtration will stop when the pressure drops to 45 millimeters of mercury. Where it needs to be normal is going to have a mean arterial pressure between 80 and 180. So again, this is one of those places where the pressure in the blood can influence this. This picture here gives a nice summary of tubular reabsorption and secretion. So these little out pictures correspond to the different areas here along the nephron. So you can see what's going in and what's going out at those different areas. And this, this will show where some of the drugs will go in the distal convoluted tubule. This also gives a nice picture here showing what's moving in, what's moving out, as well as the osmolarity of the interstitial fluid on the outside and the osmolarity of the filtrate on the inside. So things that will regulate your glomerular filtration rate. You have some renal autoregulation. The myogenic is going to reduce the GFR. This happens when stretching triggers contraction of the smooth muscle in the afferent arterioles. The tubuloglomerular mechanism is going to decrease the GFR. This is when the macula densa provides feedback to the glomerules. It's going to inhibit the release of nitric oxide, causing the afferent arterioles to constrict. So it's the same nitric oxide that can have the effect on blood vessels elsewhere in the body. So we can have neural regulation. So your kidney blood vessels are going to have sympathetic nerve fibers that can release norepinephrine and cause vasoconstriction. At rest, the renal blood vessels are maximally dilated. So renal autoregulation will prevail at that point. When you have moderate stimulation, the GFR decreases because you're going to have both afferent and efferent arterial constriction to the same degree. When you have greater stimulation, so doing exercise or hemorrhage, it's going to cause the GFR to drop even lower because it will constrict the afferent arterioles. So it will lower the urine output and allows the blood to go to other tissues. So that's an important way of shifting blood away when the body has other priorities for a little while. So then we also have the hormonal regulation that angiotensin II reduces the GFR. It's a very potent vasoconstrictor of both the afferent and efferent. It will enhance reabsorption of sodium and promote aldosterone production. So this ends up with more sodium being absorbed. It's going to pull the chloride ion with it in water. Atrial natriuretic peptide. So you may need to refer back to your cardiovascular system with this. It's going to increase the GFR. It stretches the atria. And that will occur when you have an increase in blood volume. So when the blood pressure gets really high in the heart, this would be triggered. You would have a large increase in blood volume that could promote the release of the atrial natriuretic peptide. This is going to inhibit the reabsorption of sodium and water in the proximal convoluted tubule. It will suppress ADH and aldosterone and increase the excretion of sodium. What all of those things are going to do is it's going to increase the urine output and decrease the blood volume. So this picture here nicely summarizes what's going on with this, where you've got these regulatory mechanisms in here, looking at the osmolarity of the plasma and interstitial fluid. Receptors in the hypothalamus will send information to the control center in the hypothalamus. Then you'll have that ADH being released. That will go and target the effectors to decrease the plasma osmolarity and reset homeostasis. So antidiuretic hormone increases the water permeability of the principal cells and regulates that water reabsorption. So when your 
osmolarity of the plasma and interstitial fluid decreases, ADH is secreted to increase your water reabsorption. So when it's increased, you have low blood volume, high concentrated urine. When it's decreased or low, you'll have dilute urine and a higher volume. So again, this is another diagram here showing these different things that happen in the different regions of the kidneys. There are several of these diagrams in your notes. Pick the ones you like and help click, make it click in your mind. You don't necessarily need to use all of them. They are pretty repetitive. So this one summarizes renal function. Again, showing what goes in and out. It gives a visual of the concentration or osmolarity of the filtrate. But what's a little bit different is this one will give the percentage remaining in the filtrate on kind of a graph line here. So evaluating kidney function, one of the easiest ways to do this is with a urinalysis. It's convenient, it's easy, it's not miserable for the patient. All they have to do is produce some urine. So you analyze the volume and physical properties of the urine, look at the chemical and microscopic properties as well. Water is gonna account for 95% of the total urine volume. So if you have a disease going on or something affecting kidney function, you should be able to see amounts of substances that are not normally in the urine in there to help give you some clues what's going on. Blood tests can also be helpful. You can look at the blood urea nitrogen. It's going to look at the nitrogen that's part of the urea from catabolism of amino acids. It's looking at how much is in the bloodstream. The plasma creatinine, this is from the catabolism of creatine phosphate and skeletal muscle. So it can look at renal function, how well are you dealing with that. Renal plasma clearance, the volume of blood that's cleared of a substance per unit of time. So high renal plasma clearance means you've got efficient excretion of a substance into the urine. So para-amino hippuric acid can be administered to measure renal plasma flow. So when we look at the characteristics of urine, the color varies from clear to deep yellow. Sometimes it can be almost rusty depending on the concentration of it. So more on the end of clear to pale yellow is normal. Deep yellow is really concentrated. You can occasionally have other colors that will happen. It can be red from blood in the urine, but certain foods like eating a lot of beets can cause redness of the urine that you would wanna take that into consideration. Certain drugs can discolor the urine as well. Odor, fresh urine is a slightly aromatic Stale urine tends to have a stronger, distinct smell. Um, describing smells with words can be kind of tricky. It's one of those things that with time you recognize what is normal and what is not. The pH range, it can range from 4.5 to 8 depending on a person's diet. So high protein diets will lead to a low pH. Vegetarian diets will tend to have a higher pH. The specific gravity, the normal range is 1.001 to 1.030. Distilled water has a specific gravity of one. So when the urine is more concentrated, it's got a higher specific gravity. So you don't want that too high. So things we normally find in urine, urea, uric acid, creatinine, sodium, potassium, phosphates, sulfates, bicarbonate, calcium, and magnesium. So some abnormal findings. Glycosuria is the presence of glucose in the urine. So remember, that's going to be an indication that the blood glucose level has gotten too high that it started to spill over into the urine. Proteinuria or albuminuria is protein in the urine. Ketonuria is ketones in the urine. And sometimes when people are doing ketogenic diets, they are trying to get a detectable amount of ketones in the urine. 
But if you're not trying for that and they're in there, it can be an indication of something else going on. Hemoglobinuria is hemoglobin in the urine. Hematuria is red blood cells or erythrocytes in the urine. Bilirubinuria is when you have bilirubin or bile pigments in the urine. And then pyuria would be when you have white blood cells or leukocytes in the urine. So normal urine volume is one to two liters per day. Polyuria would be an increase in urine volume greater than two liters per day. Now, if a person just all of a sudden had to, say they had to have a pelvic ultrasound done where they had to drink a large amount of water, on that day, they're going to have polyuria that's a transient thing. And there's a good explanation for it of drinking the excess water. So you want to keep in mind what is going on that may have triggered any of these things to happen as to whether or not it's really a problem. Oligouria is decreased urine volume less than 500 milliliters a day. Anuria is the absence of urine or less than 100 milliliters a day. So diuresis is a term for increased output. Diuretic is a substance that could lead to diuresis. So when looking at urine elimination, it's going to go out through the ureter. It's about 10 to 12 inches long. It is longer in a male than in a female. The mucosa are going to be transitional epithelium here. This is kind of unique to the urinary system. And you've got the lamina propria that allow them to inflate and deflate. So it's got an adventitia layer of loose connective tissue that help anchor them in place. And you'll have some lymphatics and blood vessels to supply the ureters here. The job of the ureter is to transport urine from the renal pelvis to the urinary bladder. And it does this primarily by peristalsis. So hydrostatic pressure and gravity also contribute to this. The ureters are retroperitoneal. And they're going to have mucosa, a muscularis, and fibrous coat. There is no anatomical valve at the opening of the ureter into the bladder. What happens is when the bladder gets full, it's going to put pressure and compress the ureters, preventing backflow. So this is noticeable a lot of times if you're lying in bed at night, particularly if you're lying on your back. When you get up in the morning, what happens is you shift and you pull the bladder off of that area. You're going to release those valves, more urine will flow in there, and you generally have to urinate not long after you wake up and stand up out of bed. It's kind of one of the first things that most people tend to do. So I always say if you are sleeping outside in a tent and you don't want to have to get up and go outside your tent in the cold, do not roll over and unpinch those tubes. So your urinary bladder, it's a hollow muscular organ. It's in the pelvic cavity. It's posterior to the pubic symphysis. It can hold 700 to 800 milliliters. It's not necessarily going to be comfortable at 800 milliliters. So it's posterior to the pubic symphysis. It's anterior to the vagina and inferior to the uterus in a female. So the trigone, this is where the ureters are going to enter the bladder. It's near the two posterior points in the trigone. The urethra drains from the bladder to the anterior point of the trigone. So it's a more muscular area. There's three layers in the walls. The mucosa is transitional epithelium and lamina propria. The muscularis has three layers of smooth muscle. And then the adventitia is going to be the loose connective tissue that helps anchor it in place. So in the females, the urethra is one and a half inches in length and is between the clitoris and the vagina. In the males, it's going to be longer. So the tube passes through the prostate. The difference in the ureter length in the males and females is primarily just body size difference. but. For the urethra, it's anatomical differences on where that tube has to go through. So for the male, you can see it has to go through all of this stuff and then through the penis. For the female, it's just a short little trip. 
So that also changes the risk in urinary tract infections for males and females. For females, the bacteria do not have a long journey. In males, they do have a longer journey to get in and cause a bladder infection. So the micturition reflex, which is what is gonna trigger urination. You've got stretch receptors that will be sent messages to the spinal cord when the volume exceeds 400 milliliters. If you're going, well, when do I even perceive urine in there? Usually around 150 milliliters, you can start to perceive something in there. So if you're getting ready to leave the house and you're like, should I run to the bathroom before I leave? If you have less than 100 or 150 milliliters in there, there isn't, you're going to just feel like you just went pretty much. You're not going to really notice it. So the impulses are sent to the micturition center, which is at the level of S2, S3. So those are sacral nerves there. And the reflex is triggered. And the parasympathetic fibers are going to cause the detrusor muscle to contract. And then the external and internal sphincter muscles are going to relax. So most humans do have conscious control of the external sphincter. The internal sphincter is not under voluntary control. That's involuntary. So when the bladder starts to get too full, it's going to trigger that to relax. And you're relying solely on the external sphincter. You're only going to be able to hold that for so long. So at some point, if you don't deal with emptying the bladder, even though you have voluntary control, it's going to, the muscle's just going to say, I'm done. So this picture here is another one showing the micturition reflex, a little bit simpler one that you've got the afferent message in here that's going to be from the stretch receptors going into the sacral area. It does let the brain know what's going on since you have to consciously choose to move to an area that's appropriate for releasing your urine. And then the efferent message that will go back and stimulate the detrusor muscles. So aging in the urinary system, the effectiveness of the kidneys starts to decline after 40. So that is pretty typical with a lot of things in the body. The kidneys start to shrink. They have lower blood flow and filter less. You'll have diminished sensation of thirst. So there's an increased risk of dehydration. So a lot of times in elderly people, they just really don't get thirsty and unless they consciously remember to drink, a lot of times they just won't consume very much. Also, if they have urinary incontinence, it kind of becomes a habit to drink less, which isn't really helping them either. Prostate cancer is very common in elderly men. It's common enough that they kind of say if a man lives long enough, his chances of having it are very high. Fortunately, a lot of them can be very slow growing cancer, so they may die from something else, but it doesn't mean that you don't want to address it. Um, the longevity for humans in this country is pretty high, so that's probably why we see more of the issues with prostate cancer. And then chronic and acute inflammatory diseases can become more common as you age. So with urinary incontinence, it's a lack of voluntary control over micturition. This is normal in little kids, so up to about two to three years old. The neurons to the sphincter muscle are not developed. You can have stress incontinence that will occur in adults by increased abdominal pressure. So things like coughing, sneezing, laughing, exercising, walking can cause them to leak a little bit. You can have injury to nerves, loss of bladder flexibility, damage to the sphincter. For females, pregnancy can affect this with changes of the hormones as well as the pressure of having a growing fetus in there. There's not a lot of space in the abdomen and the fetus takes up more and more of it as it grows. Also in menopause, changes in hormone levels can affect that as well. Other disorders, renal calculi, they're crystals of salt that are present in the urine. 
that can precipitate and lead to kidney stones. The problem with these is they can block a ureter. They are painful, so it's sometimes described as the worst pain a human can go through. Sometimes they can be removed by lithotripsy, which is ultrasound. Other times they just have to pass. Urinary tract infections, this is when you get bacteria in there. It's diagnosed by the presence of white blood cells in the urine, as well as potentially finding the bacteria. Urethritis, inflammation of the urethra. Cystitis, inflammation of the urinary bladder. So if you remember from medical terminology, the itis is inflammation of something. Pyelonephritis, inflammation of the kidneys. Pyelitis, inflammation of the renal pelvis and its calyces. Glomerulonephritis, inflammation of the glomerula. This is most commonly caused by an allergic reaction to toxins from strep bacteria. So you can have the strep infection in another area, but you have these toxins given off, they're processed through the kidney. So the glomeruli can be permanently damaged with this and it can lead to acute or chronic renal failure. With chronic renal failure, it's a progressive condition and is generally irreversible. You start to see a decline in the glomerular filtration rate, and this can result from several different kidney or urinary disorders. Polycystic kidney disease, this is an inherited disorder. The kidney tubules start to have hundreds or thousands of cysts in there. You get inappropriate apoptosis of the cells, and it progressively starts to impair renal function more and more until it leads to renal failure. So you've seen that the renal system does interact with other systems of the body. So waste management does happen in other body systems, just not to the extent. You can have buffers that will bind excess hydrogen ion, blood transports waste. The liver is gonna be where you're gonna do a lot of the metabolic recycling. You convert amino acids into glucose, glucose into fatty acids or toxins into less toxic things. Sweat glands are a way of reducing waste. You can eliminate excess heat, water, and carbon dioxide, and then small quantities of salt and urea can be released through the sweat. The gastrointestinal tract, this will eliminate solid waste, undigested food. You can have some carbon dioxide in there, some hydrogen gas in there, some salts, and some heat. So that can con concludes the urinary system.